Yo, what's up? We are Anti-Flag, and these are our punk rock icons. Vast, varied, and very long-winded. It's really important for us when we talk about Mount Rushmore at all to back up a little bit and think about the idea that America is invaded and these invaders kill almost all of us. After they do that, they push us onto the most uninhabitable land that still exists on the continent. And then to add insult to injury, they carve the faces of the leaders of their empire and their the, the colonists into uh, the Washington Monument or into the Statue of Liberty. That's what Mount Rushmore is. Mount Rushmore was sacred ground to the Lakota Sioux Nation. And um, it's a racist monument. <laughs> it was, the architect is a, was a white supremacist and someone who was very invested in uh, furthering the cause of white supremacy. So um, it's important that we just mention that. I personally like, I'm like, blow those faces the fuck off that mountain and give it back to Lakota Sioux, it's theirs. So that's an important point for us to make. Now that said, I get that AP is just trying to have some fun here. And <laughs> I, think, I think it is really a cool idea to think about, you know, who would be our four icons of punk? that you know we chisel into the face of cbgb's we could just instead of carving into mount rushmore we could just carve into the trump towers that are <laughs> <laughs> that's what's up if you are saying that um there are punk icons that need to be uh revered i would say that that is the antithesis of punk rock to start with because the whole goal of punk rock is to tear down the idols and to say what you've created is bullshit and we're going to create something that's more real than that and um so that it, it, the initial premise of what are should be the icons of punk rock i even have question with that as well perhaps there's a there's a thing where we put out the worst people in punk <laughs> <laughs> Four individuals in 1970s punk rock. I, I will say Mark Lath, the drummer of Generation X. Great. Wow. Mm -hmm. Drummer picks a drummer. You know he's a drummer because he's sitting in a room with drum cases. <laughs> <laughs> I also hatchet every once in a while. I've got my hatchet back there as well. Well done, Pat. I mean, I absolutely love the, the drumming by Mark Lath. I think it's like so creative, especially at a time when rock music drumming was kind of dumbed down. And that's a cool thing, like when you think about punk drumming, like Dave Grohl like took drumming from being a snare drum and a kick drum and mainstream music and just turned it on its fucking head. And punk drumming has kind of been doing that for a long time. So I think that that's a cool. Um, just flip a coin as to which one of us is going to pick Joe Strummer, or do you just want to put him up there? Let's just put Joe Strummer up there. Let's just put all the Clash up there and be done. <laughs> For me, like when I think of the 70s punk, really, it really began in New York with the CBGB scene, and like Joe Strummer was influenced by the Ramones, you know? So um, even the Sex Pistols were influenced by the Ramones. So when I think about it in that respect, you know, the people in that scene, of course, Joey Ramone to me is sort of like the you know, if I wanted to hold somebody up with kind of like a punk rock attitude, like he always wanted to be a singer in a band. He loved singing and playing music. And he was in a band before the Ramones and they weren't a punk band, they were just a rock band. And the other members of the band kicked him out because they said he wasn't cool enough to be in their band. And I just love that Joey Ramone was like, fuck you, I'm going to be the singer in a band. He never quit, he never gave up. He believed in himself and he was like, I'm gonna do it my way. I'm not gonna do it their way. I'm not gonna listen to what they told me I am. I'm gonna be who I am and do it my way. And like, the cool thing about music is I think so many performers are really most comfortable when they're on stage. And Joey Ramone, I think was such an incredible example of that because 
he was a person who really wasn't comfortable in his own skin. He was obsessive compulsive. He had like a lot of uh, emotional issues. But when he got on stage, she just became like transformed into this other character, this other person where, you know, a lot of people said like, that's where he was most comfortable. And um, I got, I was lucky enough to see the Ramones a, a, a good few times. And like, I remember just watching him on stage, like just thinking like, this guy is the coolest fucking person I've ever seen in my life. So just considering the amount of influence he had on all the people who came after him, he, he's a big one for me. Well, but so what, do we put the four of the clash, then you put more on there? You put George <laughs> Rebellion there? How's this, How, put a, put women this women How does this work? <laughs> you got to go with Susie Sue or you got to go with Debbie Harry. Yeah, Patty Smith. <laughs> I think Patty Smith was part of that CBGB scene. She's somebody who had such a profound impact on all the people like Kathleen Hanna and all the people who came after her. And she was just such a true artist. I mean, her books are incredible. Her live performances will still blow your fucking mind. Um, and she, um, and she's just really like a true artist. She was just somebody who was like, look, this is who I am. This is what I'm creating and you're going to take it or leave it. I don't care. Like I'm doing it for me. And that I think that, adds to that whole punk mystique yeah so 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 just to like actually answer the question <laughs> Gen generation x was from la correct no, no generation x London. was from uk uk okay okay yeah. good good because i don't want to have anybody from la on our thing yeah. <laughs> so oh, like, nice work. it was from la so uh, we should get rid of her in lieu Who? of susie sue oh okay yeah, yeah. Is she from no, LA? She's She's English too. Yeah, She's English, English too. as well. Okay, good, good, good. So, <laughs> uh, so we've got we've got uh, Joey Ramone. He was from New York. He's from. New York. <laughs> we got um, um, uh, Mark from Generation X. He's allowed on. Um, Patty Smith, I think, wins in my mind over a Joan Jett or a Debbie Harry. Um, but I could also Joan Jett, Jett that, that's a tough call. Joan Jett is a badass. Yeah, she's still a badass. Like she's mm -hmm. so cool. But um Joan Jett and and to uh, and Patty Smith and have it be mostly New Yorkers and one English person and move the fuck <laughs> up to the seventies. I like it. Party on. Joan Jett, we spent a lot of time with yeah. Jett and and she was by far the coolest. So yeah. uh, and, and she, that moved her up on my scale for sure, because, uh, yeah, as a human being, she's a uh, pretty badass. Not only did we meet her and have great experiences with her, we then had a large gap in between seeing her and then ran into each other and she knew who we were and was excited to see us. And that <laughs> for me was like, yo, I wake up and I don't know who I am. How the fuck is Jen? <laughs> or that's really cool. So, I, yeah, I mean, um, but I don't, I don't, I've never met Patty Smith. I would love to. Um, mm -hmm. But again, you know, I also would be okay with her not knowing who we were forever. <laughs> <laughs>
this culture of music. It was all too intellectual for me. It was all too, um, you know, I, I didn't have a th thesaurus to keep up with bad religion, but then the Dead Kennedys put it in a way that made sense and I was able to channel frustration and anger and my feelings towards police violence and corporate violence that, that happens. Um, and, and yeah, the Dead Kennedys gave me that outlet. So that's my pick. Um, and I also hate the 80s, so I'm okay with going fast through this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Dead Kennedys are, were fun too. Like they're funny. Yeah. Which is like cool about the Dead Kennedys, I think. Their music has like a Weird Al uh, carnival tinge yeah. to it that made sense to me as well. Yeah. Yeah, I would have to go with in the 80s, uh, Ian McKay or something like that from the DC scene uh, because what they did, they created music that was interesting, but they also created a, um, a subculture of straight edge, yeah. um, which, uh, which was a place where kids who didn't think that uh, drugs and alcohol were necessarily the right uh, path for them, it gave them a place within the community and within the scene. So um, not only the music, but al also the cultural um, uh, creation of the straight edge movement, which uh, is, is still important today. I'm glad, I'm glad you said that, Pat. As the last remaining lumberjack straight edge member of <laughs> uh, you hold, hold true to that. You and Ian. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what do you got, Head? Uh, how about like maybe like HR from Bad Brains, I'd say? I, I'd no. Him. He's pretty badass. Though. Arguably, there will be n none better as a front person performer than HR. HR mm -hmm. would win that currently still, just like yeah, crazy. I would go with Shane McGowan from the Pogues because he literally invented- <laughs> As, as a, a straight edge movement. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> as far away as it gets. He but I mean, if you've never listened to the Pogues, I mean, he invented uh, Celtic punk rock. I mean, there's no, without him, there's not Flogging Molly, there's not Dropkick Murphys. Um, and, you know, he was such, you know, even, there's been a couple books written by the guys in the Pogues and the stories are just beyond insane. And even when he was such a mess, like on drugs and he was such a drunkard that even the other guys in the Pogues had to kick him out of the band because he was so bad. And when they came to tell him they were kicking him out, his response was, what took so long? <laughs> like, he just like, he, he was just waiting for it. Like, but yeah, I mean, the guy is a creative genius and he has a long legacy that follows him. I don't think there's any more influential 90s punk band and really like band in rock especially like underground rock than, than Fugazi and Ian yeah. McKay. Fugazi injected all of the ethics of punk into everything they did and kept it totally like on the level, never wavered from it. $5 shows, DIY. Uh, I mean, they honestly, like when I think like DIY channel, like I'm like, that was invented by Fugazi. Like, <laughs> You know, I mean, they furthered the DIY culture and brought it into the mainstream. And musically, they broke all the rules. Like they made music that people were like, this isn't punk. And yes, it was like, you know, Waiting Room is like one of the best fucking punk songs ever. They were always pushing the boundaries. So I just think the fact that they brought ethics into it and that was the forefront of everything they did. I know for Antif, like that had, they had just such a massive impact on yeah. the kind of that we were, but I'm cheating because I'm picking somebody that we already picked in a previous era. So I don't know who else you guys got from the 90s. <laughs> Probably like most of the 80s people trend went into the 90s for me. Yeah. Like, no too many 90s ones that I would consider. How about uh, Thomas from Strike Anywhere? Would he be 90s or 2000s? Um, I would argue that Inquisition began in the 90s, so Thomas is good. Yeah. I have so many jokes that I wanted to get in. Um, <laughs> Are we missing your jokes? I'm sorry, we're missing them. The, the first is, you need four faces, you're looking at them. <laughs> uh, yeah, the second joke is some long diatribe about Fugazi being famous from being a minor threat, so no shit, they get $25 for yeah. their 
2,000 people wanted to see them. But yeah. I digress. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, Ian, for God's sake, doesn't really? happen without Minor Threat because Minor Threat was so famous. Ian McKay could have shat on a piece of cardboard and released it as a record, and everybody would have been like, this is the greatest thing ever. I would argue that he has done that several times. <laughs> And we still think it's the greatest thing ever. <laughs> so one of the things that I do love about Fugazi is um, I have a kinship with Guy in the sense that he was a fan of the band and then joined the band right at the very beginning. And I did that with Anti-Flag. Um, and there's a, there's a funny thing about him where he is so he's got like a voice and he's kind of, you know, he's like this and you don't expect that from him by the way he sings and he's kind of, yeah. you know, reserved. And then the show is so exact. And then you hear him talk. He's like, yeah, get the fuck out of here. You want to do And you're like, whoa, that is such a different personality. From <laughs> um, so um, while we are uh, speaking to each other on Columbus day and we have just, recently torn down the stat, uh, Christopher Columbus statue in Pittsburgh. I think uh, it would be sick to put a statue of Guy up and an Italian replacement. <laughs> feel good. Uh, <laughs> I see where you're going. I didn't get the Italian part of that. I, now I understand where you're going with that. <laughs> As our resident Italian uh, in the band, I, now I understand. Yeah. So, so now, yeah. If if we're worried about putting Ian up there twice, we can just slide down a little bit in the yeah. popularity rankings and go to Gee. I back that. Um, I can't, in good conscience, not put. Um, now it has to be a very specific era of Billy Joe Armstrong. His teeth have to be imperfect. His <laughs> has to be very flawed. He has to have less money than he currently has. That's <laughs> Billy Joe Armstrong that I'm putting up on my wall of icons in the 90s. Um, I think that, uh, again, just from personal experience, I, I felt such a real disconnect between being able to perform music and what people were listening to. Like, I loved punk and I loved um, these bands. I loved the Dead Kennedys. I loved Bad Religion. But it seemed like you had to you know, you had to be special to do it. And then when I saw the long view video and it was on TV and they looked kind of shitty and uh, it wasn't glossy and they weren't beautiful, that to me said, well, anybody can do this because I certainly wasn't beautiful. And so it gave me the confidence to be able to do it. So I mean, I loved that long view video when it came out i mean i fucking love every song that they released i was like this is amazing like they're all great i think one that we have to include from the 90s and you can call it grunge if you want but we have to include kurt cobain because Fuck that guy <laughs> <laughs> kurt cobain changed music and yeah. changed yeah. rock music he changed punk he changed everything and um he loved punk i mean kurt cobain would talk forever about punk like music and how much influence it had on him, which I always thought was really, really cool. I think his favorite band was Flipper. And if you never listened to Flipper, you should listen to Flipper. Well, um, me too. But yeah, so we got Kurt, we got Billy Joe. Billy Joe. Jello Biafra. Oh, Gee. Gee, Trump. sorry. Oh, well, th this this one's got a lot of people on this on this Trump Tower. And then I think probably the maybe like a Tim Armstrong or something. I was gonna say Kathleen Hanna. Yeah, that's a good one, too. I back Kathleen Hanna completely, yeah. I mean, really, she started the Riot Girl movement. I mean, she's the forefront leader of that. I mean, influenced so many women, like, to get on stage, you know, and to believe that they actually had a place at the show. I mean, we were there in the 90s. There was fucking sexist fucking assholes. And to see a band like that come through and be like, yo, girls to the front, like, that, that, was a strong message that nobody, you know, was was saying it in the way that that she was saying it. Yeah. So yeah, if if she was '90s, the '90s are actually looking pretty good to me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the '90s sucked. Yeah. Well, it, it was just really hard for you, so that's why you think. It's yeah. 
It did suck for us. I it mean, did yeah. suck for us. <laughs> yeah, we drove around in a lot of shitty vans in the 90s. But, you know, we're, we're having these conversations about representation in all things right now in 2020. And, and, and what I kind of was getting at by seeing a fucked up, toothed, shitty, pimpled face Billy Joe Armstrong, that same thing works for women who see other women involved for non-binary people who see non-binary people involved for um, black and indigenous and people of color who see that um, on a stage. So that's why we need to do our best to allow representation to take hold so that it gives the ability for people to see themselves in those positions. And yeah. Be needed to get there. Yeah, because you have to understand that there's a place for you there. And if you don't see other people who look like you or who are um, who remind you of yourself in those positions, then you don't believe you can do it. And we're we're firm believers that everybody has a voice within punk rock and everybody we want everybody to everybody's voice to be out there so that we can carry the dialogue forward. Um, really really cool things happening in punk um um i i love like the riot folk diy basement scene movement uh i loved what strike anywhere was doing um what against me was doing in the basement scene there was a lot of really cool um things that were happening especially as punk had kind of catapulted once again into the mainstream Typically when that happens in the DIY and basement scene, there's something far more special going on anytime uh, uh, it gains or, or garners such uh, public knowledge. So I would put Evan Greer on the 2000s. Uh, so it's hard not to go like, you know, this pipe is, this bike is a pipe bomb type shit, but um, um, it's also hard not to go hot water music in the 2000s. Chuck Reagan definitely deserves a place. Evan Greer, she's she's incredible, and mm -hmm. um, that Riot Folk thing was so cool. I saw it so many times and interacted with it so many times. It was its own, it was its own scene, and it was like, yo, you don't need to have a band, you don't need to look a certain way, you don't need to have any friends, you just need to have an idea in your heart, and you could share it a cappella, or you could share it with an acoustic guitar and bang it on buckets, whatever you've got, you've got to do it and get it out. And um, that was a really cool, cool thing that happened in the early 2000s. Yeah. I think like Rancid in the early 2000s were incredible. So there's where, for me, like coming back to Chris Head's suggestion, like Tim Armstrong comes in. I mean, yeah. Rancid Tim, Tim easily, you know, all of the guys in Rancid in a way. I mean, it's kind of amazing when you think about who was in Rancid, like in the impact that, like how many times do you think Matt Freeman hears somebody say, because of you, I play bass guitar, you know? I hear kids say that's a number two all the time. <laughs> and, I, and I know that I, the, in the, the few times I've been around Matt Friedman, I've literally heard people say that to him, you know? Like, and the, the thing that's so dope is he's like, oh, really? Here, have a pick. And he pulls the guitar pick out, which I thought was super dope. For, um, every, for every person who tells me you're the reason I play bass, there are three people who tell me you're the second best bass player to Matt Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. You're the reason to quit playing bass too. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is a good uh, point. I like that. That's beautiful. Um, yeah, so but... I like that so far. Evan Greer, um, Tim Armstrong, or, or Matt Freeman, whichever. In uh, love. Okay, we're done. But Dave King from Flogging Molly. I mean, Flogging Molly made incredible records in the early 2000s. And again, just a person that brought that type of music into, you know, to so many ears. And Flogging Molly was a band that was, for me, what I really liked about them is they, they were all about the vibe, all about like, everyone take care of each other, everyone be good to each other. But if they had something that they strongly believed in, they said it, they were the first band I heard on Warp Tour after the Iraq war started to say, fuck George Bush. And you know, there were bands on that tour that were, had been political in the past, 
you know, who kind of were shying away from that because it was the beginning of the Iraq war and it was an unpopular thing to say. <clears throat> and I was really impressed that Dave King just stood up on stage and said, this war is fucking wrong. And um, so for me, you know, on top of all of his, his songwriting, um, if, you know, if you've never really listened to Flogging Molly, check out um, It's the Worst Day Since Yesterday or one of those songs like they're, they, they just have um, really beautiful lyrics, really poetic and great, great melodies and great, a great live show. I'm going to, I'm going to finish it. Okay. We're done. We're going to move <laughs> on. Uh, just to recap, Evan Greer, Tim Armstrong, uh, Dave King, and then the final spot is going to go to Thomas Barnett from Strike Anywhere. Boom. Yeah. Best yeah. political punk lyric writer that there is. Great front man. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's not a Strike Anywhere song that I don't go, fuck, I wish we wrote that lyric. Right. Every, every single one. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. I 150,000% agree. <laughs> Yeah, you have to remember that the goal of the Mount Rushmore is spectacle and it is to make things into something bigger than life and to uh, create power and, um, yeah, and uh, godlike um, personas. So um, all of that is bullshit and we don't want to do that. However, there are people who have done amazing things, whether that's uh, Martin Luther King or uh, Malcolm X or, you know, all those those people who are um, who do amazing things. However, they are all flawed and not godlike. So it is hard to put them on into granite and say they are like God. Yeah. I, and, 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 you know, we, we kind of talked a bit about this before is that, um, you know, uh, if you're giving us a magic wand, what we want to do is return Mount Rushmore to the people that it rightfully belongs to first. Um, but if the question is who are our inspirations and who are our heroes, I think that we could answer that. And, and, and for me, I think that I'd begin with Emma Goldman and mm -hmm. say that if Emma Goldman were not fighting for women's rights, for birth control advocacy, for the things that we take for granted in a 2020, um, for, for the, anti, uh, the, the, the anarchist movement, for the anti-fascist movement, for all of the things that she essentially laid her life on the line for continually throughout her lifetime, um, uh, we wouldn't be as quote unquote woke as we are today without the work that she did. So I think that, um, um, you know, maybe our, maybe our wall, maybe we're not uh, carving into stone as much as we are carrying their spirit in our hearts. So if we're going to take it a little bit hippie, um, Emma Goldman would be the first one that I would choose. Yeah, she's great. You know, the abolitionist Frederick Douglass. So I think historians and journalists are incredibly important because they give us an honest look about at, at who, where we came from and who we were and how we got to where we are. And, you know, when, when we're honest about those things, we, we can actually correct uh, injustices of the past. So, you know, Howard Zinn um, is just, you know, someone who's always been an incredible inspiration to me. And he wrote The People's History of the United States. And, you know, if you, you want to, you know, a different version or a different way of presenting American history, um, he has a really incredible way of presenting it. And he, you know, he fought in World War II. He fought the fascists in World War II. And he believed in that cause, but you know, through that experience, it really changed the way he he looked at history, and he ended up becoming an avid anti-war crusader. And um, you know, um, and and those are the kind of people that I think it is important for us to hold up. You know, people who are anti-war, people who um, people who are honest about the history of our country so that we can actually cor correct the wrongs of the past or, or make or do our best to make amends or reparations for the past. You know, again, thinking about just us and knowing that we wouldn't be here without Woody Guthrie. Um, mm, dope. And feeling like you need, while we have um, activists, we have historians, 
we need something from the art side and 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 woody guthrie is is certainly it and 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 woody's legacy is you know consistently reinvented whether if it comes in the form of a bob dylan and then bob dylan is transformed into what we now know as punk rock and from what punk rock has done and the ideals and the ethics of punk rock being transformed into new genres of music that are being fucking created on people's phones because of economic constraints uh or inabilities or the not having the necessity of having a studio anymore but just having an an idea within you and needing to get it out i think that 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 change is always happening and um I think that that's where, you know, kind of coming back to this whole idea and going throughout the history of of the artists that that we um, still carry with us to this day, the the common thread amongst all of them is that they weren't doing it for anybody but themselves, and they were trying to be true to themselves uh, uh, and and trying to let that truth speak to others. And so I think that that. Um, that's always been the goal of Anti-Flag is to um, see what we see happening in the world, comment on it truthfully, and hope that that truth connects with other people. Amen.